Okay, so uh, let's get started. Welcome to this today's uh, worldwide uh, seminars on the neurobiology of addiction. I do replace uh, Megan Creed, who was uh, supposed to be the host, but as a few minutes late, she'll be here for the Q&A session. And today we have the great pleasure to have Véronique de Roche from Bordeaux here. And as always, she'll be introduced by Christina Miliano. Um, this is actually the last talk of this uh, series before the summer break, which will last until September 9. So stay tuned. We're going to publish the program uh, over the next few days. We already have a good batch of new speakers until Christmas. And so now, without any further ado, please, Christina, introduce today's speaker. Yes, thank you. Um, it is my distinct pleasure today to introduce Dr. Darash. Um, she got her PhD in neuroscience and pharmacology at the University of Bordeaux, and she went to the Scripps Research Institute, Institute La Jolla, California, to have her postdoctoral training in the Department of Neuropharmacology. She then went back to France and got a position at the University of Bordeaux, where she's leading a team since 2003, working on psychobiology of drug addiction at the Neurocentre Magendie. She published more than 50 papers and she has over 6,000 citations. Um, moreover, during her career, she created the first multi-symptomatic animal model of addiction, which was recognized worldwide as a major innovation. And using this preclinical model, she's trying with their team to identify the psychobiological mechanisms involved in the pathological transition to addition to addiction for several drugs of abuse. Without further ado, I'll give the word to Dr. Darash. Thanks a lot, Christina, for the nice introduction. And uh, so good evening, morning, afternoon to everybody, whoever you are. Um, and I can share, this is it. I have the, the hand on it, okay. So thanks a lot again, Christina. And um, so it's, 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 I realize that it's a worldwide neurobiology seminars and I'm not going to talk a lot about neurobiology. Um, uh, so the title, and, and, and again, Christian, there is nothing except a, a space issue regarding the size of mouse compared to rat. <laughs> so how do I know my rat or mouse or monkey or cat or dog or whatever? Uh, animal uh, you want is addicted. And uh, the subtitle could be Diagnosing Addiction in Animal Models and uh, uh, talking about the issue of criteria and, and, and first the issue of threshold. So uh, indeed, how do I know my rat uh, is addicted? Uh, on the left, you have a drug user rat and on the right, an addicted rat. How do you uh, know who's who? So, um, we're going to talk, I mean, we are going to um, talk about why I think this is an important question to answer. How do I know my rat is addicted? Uh, we're going to see what should be, what I think should be considered uh, when we want to answer this question, how we can answer it. And then we'll go to a, a conclusion. And, and, and if we have time, and if I'm not too long as usual, <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll talk about a little bonus. Um, so let's start with why, why is it important to try answering this question? First, uh, because models, animal models in general and animal models of addiction in particular are questionable, questionable and, and they should be, and they are questionable of course, and their reliability is questioned. And, First, because their predictive validity um, is not necessarily optimal. So, uh, and one is one of the reasons of the maybe relative poor predictive validity of animal models of addiction is maybe we have not been extremely good uh, at answering is my rat addicted or not. Then there is also the question of relevance and usefulness. Um, these are also this is also questioned. Addiction for some is too complex to be modeled in animals and some question 
the usefulness of animal models of addiction. Maybe I can have the uh, pointer. And um, for, for others also, and it's an interesting question, addiction is not necessarily a brain disease or a disease. And uh, this is something that has emerged a long time ago already as a question. And uh, either, I mean, Mayer and Pomerleau uh, said that com commencing in the early 60s, many behavioral and social scientists were critical of the disease model of alcoholism. And, and still this question is very, uh, 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 is very um, present now. Is addiction a brain disease or a, model, a moral failing? Uh, Nick either tells us that it's neither one or the other. So um, models are questioned. I can continue, why? Okay, maybe it's a pointer, sorry. So whether addiction uh, is a brain disease or not is an interesting question. And I just want to exchange a little bit around that. Um, and, and why, what are the argument of people um, defending this position, which is an interesting position. And um, for example, as an argument, uh, it is mentioned that the opioid crisis supports that addiction is not a brain disorder, but is more or less all about social factors and drug availability. And also that trying to map addiction to brain changes is vain uh, not only because it's not a, a brain disease, but also because it's too complex. So uh, I, 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 in this context, I think that the parallel with the type two diabetes crisis is, is, is quite interesting. Um, type two diabetes is exploding with Western uh, lifestyle. So we can talk about type two diabetes crisis. But at the same time, I think that it doesn't mean that type 2 diabetes is not a metabolic disease uh, anymore. It doesn't render animal models of diabetes irrelevant or useless. And it does not question the relevance of studying uh, the biological mechanisms of diabetes. Uh, regarding the fact that trying to map addiction to brain changes is vain, um, okay, path and trajectories to addiction may differ and may be very various, but the expression of addiction itself appears more homogeneous. And eventually mapping expression of addiction to brain function might be useful together with exploring how various social psychological factors contribute to this uh, development of addiction. So maybe there is a place for neurobiology in this context. And again, going back to the uh, parallel with diabetes, uh, nobody is questioning the relation, um, the fact that we map or relate diabetes to insulin resistance. And, um, and, and also it is clearly acknowledged and, and recognized that the individual risk for type two diabetes is not solely molecular or biological, but also behavioral. And uh, as for what I was mentioning regarding mapping expression of addiction to brain function, together with exploring social and psychological factors contributing to, to development of addiction, uh, at the same time uh, regarding uh, diabetes, there is a, a strong interest in understanding uh, social and psychological risk factors that will favor overeating and disadvantage physical activity. And this is recognized as as important. So both type of factors can contribute to this, um, to this, uh, let's say, disease. <laughs> um, and what is interesting, I think, is that eventually um, people working on diabetes have more or less, or treating diabetes have more or less the same problem as, as we have uh, regarding uh, how do I know my rat is addicted? And here, how do I know my uh, rat is diabetic? Or how do I, does one define, decide as a subject is diabetic? Is diabetic? And we are uh, encountering somehow the same questioning, which is again criteria for defining the uh, 
the uh, the condition and threshold for defining the condition. And for example, um, this was in 2010, 2011, 2010, uh, and it's still uh, questioning and it's still debating. American, uh, the American Diabetes Association has recommended an alternative definition of the diagnosis of diabetes. And for example, it, this is moving and this is changing. And interestingly, um, insulin resistance is used as a as a uh, as a as a tool as a marker of uh, pre-diabetic or diabetic uh, condition, and it's tr interesting to to see here that uh, and we will come back to that later that eventually maybe the best model to identify where the limit is is to define bimodal distribution I mean to evidence bimodal distribution and uh, and and bimodal mo models uh, eventually um, maybe the most efficient uh, approach and strategy to evidence where to put the limit between um, diabetic and non-diabetic, or at least what an insulin resistance is as a marker of uh, pre-diabetic and diabetic uh, condition. So anyway, sorry for this uh, uh, little uh, side uh, path uh, uh, regarding uh, diabetes, but um, whether addiction is a disease or not, to come back to the main topic, is a matter of perspective. And um, it's interesting to see that uh, Jerome Wakefield recently um, somehow, somehow proposed a, a, uh, a new perspective, which is called harmful dysfunction perspective, which somehow um, reconcile um, the two, um, the two uh, neurobiological and 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 uh, and uh, non-brain disease perspective, where it tried to explain uh, how there there can be a mental disorder in a normal brain. Uh, whatever it is, and 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 um, what we can't deny anyway is that a number of drug users ask for support, and. Um, because of a maladapted drug use, maladapted to their social environment, even if, even if this drug use is adapted to their internal in environment. So we can't deny that. We can't deny it. Whether you consider it a disease or not, you can't deny that people are asking for support. So eventually, maybe the threshold between non-problematic adapted and problematic use, maladapted, could be uh, or is an operational key to modeling addiction and uh, to translation. So uh, know that we have discussed why it's important to answer this question, uh, what should be considered to, uh, to answer it. So first we have to consider that, and we, had con we have considered, most of us have considered that, that the concept of addiction has changed and this is a nice review. Uh, I talk about the history of the concept of addiction. And uh, so the clinical, first, the clinical definition has changed and, and progressively we, we shifted from drug use maintained, amplified by psych psychopharmacological mechanisms, like implicating conditioning, tolerance, withdrawal. And we shifted progressively to a more maladaptive drug use with difficulty to control craving, difficulty to limit drug intake, maintenance despite negative consequences. So we have an evolution of the clinical definition of addiction over years. And um, it's interesting that, of course, this definition um, and, the, and, 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 their, and its evolution um, have, an, have had an impact on uh, the treatment strategies. And it's quite interesting here that um, this also had, has had an impact on how we have modeled addiction uh, eventually, or how we've moved uh, for um, modeling uh, addiction. So first, first, um, the, the first and related to the definition of addiction, the main um, treatment strategy was kicking positive associations or habits. So the objective was to uh, associate drug use, drug seeking, drug itself with negative effects like in a counter conditioning strategy and what was called aversion or aversive therapies. 
And in this, um, in this type of uh, treatment strategy or therapeutic uh, strategies, extinction and desensitization takes place too. But um, aversion have took quite a, an important uh, position and in, in, in still. So for example, everybody, uh, I won't pronounce the name, it's antabuse uh, in the treatment of alcohol, of alcoholics uh, producing an aversive effect. And uh, it became famous with uh, uh, the Professor Adok and, uh, but it hasn't, been, uh, it hasn't been created by Professor Thomas Sol, of course, but it became uh, famous uh, in this cartoon. And in the same line, emetine producing an emetic effect when associated with alcohol was one of these aversive therapies. And this, as you can see, uh, is as, as old as 1949. And still uh, in the recent years, uh, there are investigation of the neurobiological mechanisms of chemical aversion. Um, and in that case, it's emetine um, for alcohol use disorder. So this, was to evoke this first type of aversion therapy, which, has, which was chemical. And, uh, but also um, people develop aversion therapy by electric shock, which was called the quite simple technique. And uh, so this was in, in 1974, even sooner. And uh, we, have, we have an interesting comment and an interesting, interesting sorry, um, experiment here and paper here where the effect of electric shock on responding maintained by cocaine use in rhesus monkeys. And um, this comment is quite interesting, uh, saying that few studies have been conducted on punishment of drug maintained responding. And uh, the author said that these studies are important since punishment is considered an effective technique for eliminating human drug abuse. So at that time, it was considered that um, this was a uh, therapeutic option. And uh, still in 2004, there uh, in the context of cocaine also, uh, there was uh, this example of um, a comparison of three aversion therapies in the context of cocaine uh, craving. And it's chemical, electrical, and covert uh, sensitization. So we, uh, just to give an example of that, what this aversion therapy by electric shock was very simple. You, you understood it. It's just um, randomly associating um, the smell of whiskey with shock and uh, 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 the smell, which is supposed to have no smell, of colored water with nothing. And to uh, repeatedly um, associate whiskey with uh, the smell of whiskey with this uh, electric shock. And the same, I mean, it could also be. Uh, um, associating cards showing pictures of bottles with shock, for example, or um, neutral cards with nothing. And uh, so we can see that six months after leaving hospital for this uh, specific case, um, the person was abstinent, although his condition is recognized as being very far from stable. So it had some effect, but not completely. And there are other examples we won't enter into, but the idea is you understand the principle is just punishing and, uh, and also um, rather you're counter conditioning the, uh, um, the cues associated, uh, the, the drug cues uh, from the positive uh, effect of drug. They also tested it directly uh, in this paragraph, um, they evoke the fact that they were not punishing um, the cues in that, I mean, not counter conditioning the cues in that case, but they were directly punishing when uh, the person was uh, drinking. So it could be also punishment in that case. Uh, and progressively, we've seen uh, a shift in the method also due uh, related to the fact that the definition of addiction has, has, has moved uh, and from kicking positive associations to improving control and notably reinforcing abstinence uh, in what we uh, know uh, by contingency management. It could also be 
uh, skills training with the uh, cognitive behavioral uh, techniques. So improving control rather than um, punishing and uh, counter conditioning positive association. And we've seen um, in this beautiful uh, paper and study by Karen Hershey that uh, maybe aversive therapies are not the best options because uh, in this paper, what we learn is that cocaine addicts undervalue a negative outcome compared to a, a non-addict. And not only they undervalue a negative outcome, but they resist to the devaluation of a positive reinforcer. So all in all, aversion therapy are maybe not the best. And um, since we are in the kicking positive association or kicking uh, bad habits uh, context here, I can't resist to the um, to the uh, to presenting to just citing this uh, very nice comment uh, of Kent Barrage, rethinking habits in addiction. The comments to a paper by uh, by Yuna and Serge and uh, about a very beautiful paper too. So um, and uh, this was just a little words, few words about. Um, about therapies and treatment strategies. And we can know, I mean, of course, I'm particularly interested by cocaine. So um, this uh, review by Kampmann, um, a very recent review, uh, summarized the treatment of cocaine disorders we, we can um, in, in a very, very nice way. So, and much better than uh, in this uh, little summary. Um, so, okay. What, could be what should be considered too, we should take into account uh, the criteria and, and how they evolved when we consider defining what an addicted rat he is. And uh, this is just the example from the shift to 1994 to 2013. And uh, the diagnosis has changed. And uh, you all know that, that we have com combined the, 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 the drug abuse and, and drug addiction into this uh, substance use disorder of the DSM-5. And okay, but what does it mean when we think about threshold and, and defining where we place um, the limit to define an addict or not? And we, when we consider, for example, um, this, uh, modified version uh, of the table uh, from peer. Um, let's consider cocaine addiction as defined according to the DSM-4. Either it's no, either, either it's abuse only, either it's dependence. And according to the DSM-5, we have these four possibilities, known, mind, moder moderate, and severe. And uh, if we consider dependence according to the DSM-4, we can see here that uh, about 10% of this uh, sample uh, diagnosis, diagnosed as dependent according to the DSM-4 DSM is indeed diagnosed as mild or moderate and not severe in the DSM-5. So this is to illustrate that putting a limit in, uh, in, in, in defining um, uh, a use disorder uh, has moved and uh, is a critical question. What we should consider also is that uh, not all users develop an addiction and there is an individual risk. This is now something we have integrated in uh, all our approaches, most of us. And um, what we have, what we are considering now also is that uh, addiction is a dynamic process. And here we should, uh, we should cite Jochen Wolfram, who has been somehow a pioneer in all this, um, in, 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 the in the very early 90s, in this questioning about what addiction is. And he tells us, and he reminds us that the development of drug dependence in man is a long lasting process, which includes several distinct stages. And during this period, the attitude of the consumer toward the drug changes. And then he evoked the what he called the point of no return, 
which is a little dramatic as a term, it may be the a turning point would be more positive, but you talk about a point of no return uh, that should be a target for experimental research on drug dependence, where you shift from control to what he calls loss of control. And he says, and that's an important point, that animal models of long-term development of dependent, dependence should permit study of the period of transition between these two states, the point of no return or the turning point. So it tells us that one uh, important uh, characteristic of animal models is that they allow longitudinal studies. So how, how have we been doing that and how can we do that? Asking this question, responding this question. Regarding clinical definition, we, if we put it into the uh, human definition perspective, we shift from rat no spoke for drug to rat no spoke for drug in a maladaptive way. And um, the question is, and we have the question we have to answer, and we have been trying to answer is. How do we, how do you evidence maladaptive cocaine intake in rodents? Uh, and what has been done in this context mostly is evaluating maladaptive drug seeking or drug taking by um, either uh, evaluating drug seeking taking despite negative consequences. And if, if drug seeking taking is maintained despite negative consequences, then we conclude addiction or drug choice over an alternative natural reinforcer. And if an animal makes the choice of drug over an alternative natural reinforcer, then we conclude addiction. And uh, these negative consequences have been uh, chemical adulteration or electrical punishment. So that's interesting to see that what something was used as a mean to uh, eventually uh, cure addiction became a tool to evidence addiction. So uh, in the context of drug choice, um, the alternative reinforcer that have been used are, uh, as you probably may know, sucrose, saccharine, and more recently social reinforcers by um, Marco Veniho and, and, and the Sham team. Here, I'd like to again, uh, uh, I like, I mean, Side the, the, the work of uh, Jochen Wolfram and, and Andrea Heine were somehow pioneer uh, in this context. And they were showing that after several months without access to ethanol, the intake of alcohol by experienced rats differed distinctly from that of ethanol naive individuals. And notably, it was characterized by a raised level of drug consumption, which was maintained even when a taste aversive constituent quinine was added to the ethanol, ethanol solution. So maintenance, high consumption, despite taste aversive um, constituent negative consequences. Uh, OK. On one side, cocaine seeking despite negative consequences. On the other side, cocaine choice of an alternative reinforcer. So the thing is that when this uh, paper, when these studies were done, what we observed is that cocaine seeking, despite negative consequences in this paper by Van der Schoen and Everett, um, produced the effect in all rats, meaning that all rats were um, maintaining cocaine seeking despite a negative consequence. But then on the other side, search team showed that uh, none of the rats would choose cocaine over an alternative natural reinforcer. So let's do here a little bit of history that will bring us to the threshold issue. And, and in the middle of that, we were, and we had some rats maintaining cocaine seeking despite negative consequences. So all rats, some rats, none of the rats. Uh, and, and in our case, it was 30 to 35% of the rats maintaining cocaine seeking and taking despite negative consequences. So one of the conclusion was that um, cocaine was 
poorly addictive in rats because it was not chosen in face of an alternative reinforcer. And the reason why it was uh, maintained, uh, cocaine seeking was maintained despite negative consequences on the, in these studies was proposed to be, sorry, to be due to lack of choice in the two cases, just drug and nothing else. It was a, a very interesting uh, a proposal. And, um, and the difference between these two that all rats were um, maintaining cocaine seeking uh, as compared to this study could be explained maybe that seeking had no negative consequences per se here. It was a salient cue um, previously associated with a shock in a different environment that was signaling a potential danger. But seeking and taking were not um, punished and had no consequent negative consequences per se. Why here seeking and taking had negative consequences and were punished. So maybe explaining part of the difference. And this was confirmed by Jan Plu in uh, 207 when, by implying in the same type of protocol, direct negative consequences and exploring individual variations in larger group uh, and obtaining something like 25% of animals, uh, maintaining cocaine seeking despite negative consequences only, not all of them. And on the other side, when exploring individual variations in larger group, Serge and his team evidence uh, a maximum nine to 15% of animals that were maintaining cocaine choice um, I mean, what we are, they were choosing cocaine over an alternative rainforest. So, um, but still we were confronting to a strange situation that on one side, when uh, cocaine um, was available against sucrose, only a maximum of 15% of animals would take it and we would choose it and prefer it. And on the other side, when cocaine was punished by an electric food shock, you had more animals choosing cocaine. So higher proportion of rats choosing cocaine when faced with negative consequences. So again, the lack of, lack, lack of choice could be, uh, could, be, uh, could be the reason. But then uh, Jan Pelou in 2015 combined both. So punished cocaine versus sucrose. So it gave the opportunity to the animal to uh, make the choice between the two. And I mean, it reaches something like 30% of rats who maintain cocaine seeking despite negative consequences and in presence of sucrose. And then on the other side, this maximum 50% was uh, uh, revealed to increase when uh, increase in contingency between cocaine and sucrose choice um, when contingency between cocaine and sucrose choice sorry was increased and this is a, a very nice paper by uh, Yuna in neuropsychopharmacology in 2016 where either in a discrete choice procedure or continuous choice procedure um, you have a, a, a strong increase um, in the number of animals choosing cocaine uh, over sucrose. Um, but again, I mean, then we are facing a, a problem. Cocaine seeking despite negative consequences or cocaine choice over an alternative a natural reinforcer, 20, 30, 15, 10, 45. Where do we place a threshold to define maladaptive drug seeking, drug taking? Where is, where is it? So how do we know that it reflects a, a maladaptive behavior? rather than just the expression of a normal continuum of individual differences in uh, these given conditions. So where do we place a threshold and um, is that just expression of a continuum and nothing maladaptive? So um, on, on one side, regarding choice as um, completely um, obvious that uh, it's easy. You make a choice or not. So the 50% limit is, 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 is very convenient. And uh, the thing is that 
uh, we know also, in particular in the case of cocaine, that this choice is sensitive to the drug on board. So where do we put the limit? And on the other side, um, regarding cocaine seeking despite negative consequences, um, it came out that the threshold based on the expression of a bimodal distribution of the population could be sort of a, an interesting perspective. And uh, this also reminds us of what people are now doing for diabetes, for example, and considering that population that split into two can much better dissociate uh, extreme non-adaptive versus adaptive uh, response. So, and here, when we look at this, um, this is from David, uh, a paper we did with David in, in 2011, and, and we have this bimodal distribution of, of punished cocaine um, seeking. And we, as we were mentioning earlier, 30 to 35% of the population uh, constitute the uh, second uh, uh, population and the extreme population. So regarding cocaine seeking despite negative consequences, we can observe a bimodal distribution and, and this can help us uh, evidencing uh, extreme animals. And Jan Pelou uh, in the same paper of 2015 I was just mentioning earlier, where he, he, he gives a choice between uh, punished cocaine and, and sucrose, uh, what we see here, and, and, and in addition, um, he compared animals uh, who had a short access versus a, a previous long access, like one hour or six hours daily session in the uh, search uh, model. And um, he, he, he shows that uh, he has something like 17% of the animals, of the short access animal that uh, maintain cocaine seeking despite these conditions and this reached uh, 30 percent for the long access rat. and uh, here they are and what we see here is that the long axis compared to the short axis the triangles white and gray uh, we clearly see and this was confirmed by uh, statistics is that uh, the long axis uh, rats showed by model distribution while uh, and the uh, show uh, uh, by model distribution sorry and the uh, long the short axis show uh, uh, a normal distribution not uh, by model one and uh, on this extreme part we have 30 percent of rats for the long axis and 17 percent of rats for the short axis although very importantly the distribution is normal and what is interesting is that when you add sucrose into the, 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 the picture. So this is for cocaine only, punished cocaine only. When you add the sucrose into the picture, what you see is that you have a, a decrease in the proportion of uh, animals, short access animals, maintaining uh, cocaine seeking. And uh, these are the, 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 the circle, the white circle here, and the distribution remains normal. And what is interesting is that the long axis, the proportion of animals in the long axis group, despite the uh, sucrose proposal and choice, they almost do not decrease and remain uh, around 30%. And what is interesting is that uh, this uh, distribution remain by model, which are this uh, circle here. So, bimodal distribution seems to be able to uh, isolate animals um, which stably show a um, maladaptive cocaine seeking. So, and to continue on that, here is a, a, a study that um, was based on search uh, choice procedure. And in this case, is, this was made by the Marcus Heilig team and uh, here in this case, the choice is between alcohol and, 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 and saccharine. And uh, they evidence 15% of rats showing a, a preference for alcohol. And um, in this study, 
what is interesting and what is uh, a complement of what I've just mentioned earlier in that they combine the different, um, uh, the different um, uh, approaches, meaning uh, a test of uh, choice and a test of punishment, not the two together, but separately. So animals were selected on their choice for alcohol and uh, this is drug choice over an alternative drug, uh, natural reinforcer, sorry. And regarding drug seeking, despite uh, negative consequences, they showed that cis animal that were alcohol preferring rats here, they uh, were resistant to quinine adulteration, negative consequences. They were also resistant to food shock. And um, on the top of it, they uh, were showing a higher progressive ratio. And what I wanted to show here is that we could be tempted, you could be, we could all be tempted to say, okay, why, while doing all these complex things and just studying progressive ratio, which would be much more simple. And I would like to show you if, um, based on, 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 on David's data here, is that uh, if we look at, this is the same bimodal distribution for cocaine punishment. And if we, of course, uh, split the population based on this bimodal uh, distribution. We have the low, the high, and of course they differ. This is the response to punishment. And um, yeah, okay, like uh, the paper on alcohol, we just showed progressive ratio because we tested them also for progressive ratio. They differ, okay, great. But if you look at the progressive ratio distribution, this is the same rats. You look at their distribution, the scores of their distribution for progressive ratio, and you take also the 35% highest part of the population. And of course, you have high and low because you've divided them like this. But then, if you look at the punishment, they don't differ anymore. So, define how you look at the data and uh, can have a strong impact on. on, on, on and, 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 and more than that, the criteria you use uh, makes a big difference. So maladaptive drug use, okay. Um, progressive ratio is, 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 uh, is not a measure of that, at least up to the point, maybe you find a, a bimodal distribution. So to go back to the dynamic process, uh, I will skip that because it was just to say and to mention that there are one aspect we haven't evoked uh, on this uh, on this uh, criteria and on this uh, threshold issue is the fact that with animal models you can uh, study it over time, as mentioned by uh, Johann Wolfgang. And um, what just I wanted to to show here is that with this type of model, and we will concentrate on, on these two uh, part, is that after early drug use in terms of, of cocaine self-administration, at least, we, we have been able and we are able to um, identify animals that will later develop a maladaptive drug use and maladaptive cocaine seeking. And uh, after early drug use, like here, like uh, early impulsive like drug seeking or early high drug induced seeking or early high frequency use um, data we have obtained with, with, with David and with Fernando, um, all these early predict the shift to this uh, uh, maladaptive cocaine seeking. And, uh, but we can also uh, identify behavior that predicts phenotype, that predicts uh, this risk for this addiction-like behavior um, prior to self-administration, like eye novelty preference, or uh, like David showed uh, when, he, when he started in, in Cambridge, the uh, eye impulsivity in a five choice uh, test. So just to say that there is a possibility to uh, study and uh, early uh, in animal models, the development of a maladaptive drug use. So to conclude, uh, I would like to say that animal models of addiction in, in, in I would like to, to, to come back to this question, are they useful or not? I would like to say from what I've shown that the addiction bathwater and the bathwater in general is still cloudy. And uh, I would suggest not to throw the animal models 
out with the bathwater. So I think we still have a lot to, to learn and in particular what they can or should be useful for. Uh, for sure, that's the object, one of the objectives, bringing new effective treatment to people in need. And um, of course, these uh, maladaptive individual longitudinal based approaches are quite new and it's still early to know, but um, there are some promising translational value there. And, and for example, the paper by the uh, ILIC team uh, evidence um, and, and show a translational uh, marker uh, uh, through GAP3 uh, that they manipulated and mo modulated uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, maladaptive alcohol intake. And this uh, decrease of GAP3 in the central amygdala was found also in alcohol dependent, rat uh, no, alcohol in alcohol dependent uh, uh, patient uh, studied post mortem. So, bringing new effective treatment for sure, but uh, animal models could also be useful for refining our definition and views of addiction and, and maybe just to challenge the brain disease model of addiction. And, uh, and there is place to uh, answer uh, Nick Ethers and colleague question. And uh, one of their um, comment is that neuroscientists, if, if we want them to buy the uh, uh, brain disease model, neuroscientists have to show that these uh, neural changes are specific and specifically related to severity of addiction. And I think that this is something we have shown, for example, for uh, synaptic plasticity. Um, they, um, we have to show that these changes do not reverse with prolonged abstinence and that these changes increase the risk of relapse after a period of abstinence. So I think that animals' models have their role to play, especially in this maladaptive individual longitudinal based strategies to uh, contribute to refining uh, definition and views of addiction. And uh, to conclude uh, before a little bonus if I have time is that uh, I would like to conclude that studying drug addiction, uh, we, when studying drug addiction, we should, we should consider uh, always that there are no facts and only interpretation. And uh, what looks like like six for some is nine for others. And uh, so I would suggest that we continue analyzing discrepancies uh, and challenging animal models. And um, because we, you know, and we have seen that, that in animal models, what it looks like is often what, not what it is. And uh, this is where I, I will place my bonus if I have five minutes, Christina, is that, um, uh, a study that we did um, and part of the PhD of Vernon Garcia uh, Rivas, who is at, at Yale currently as a postdoc. Um, I'd I like to, through a, a nicotine study, uh, I like this, um, this fact that animal models, um, as, as, as search, for example, has, has shown many, many times that what it looks like is often not at all what it is. And very rapidly, um, if we consider what drives smoking, so we shift totally to nicotine. Uh, nicotine, what drives smoking? Nicotine acts as a primary reinforcer, weak as a reward, it's considered as, but uh, quite strong for withdrawal avoidance. So it's a primary reinforcer. But um, it's also known um, uh, for increasing reinforcement and, and, and smoking can be uh, driven by uh, this effect, nicotine increasing the reinforcement of surrounding stimuli, like uh, the cup of coffee uh, is, 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 is much uh, tasty and nicer uh, under nicotine effect. And also um, another uh, factor, other factors that drives smoking, it's cues acting as conditioned reinforcer after, after they have been associated with nicotine, either the primary reinforcing effect or the uh, increasing reinforcement effect. But um, data in, 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 in humans support that individual variations, that there are individual variations in the, re the relative weight of each factor. It is considered that all of these contribute to dependence, but for now, most of the people consider that it has the same weight in everybody. And uh, going into the literature into deep, we, 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 can't see, we, we evidence or we, we, we found data that really suggests that there are individual variations in the relative weight. 
and, 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 and of each factor depending on, on, on the smokers. And notably regarding the primary reinforcing effect of nicotine, we know for quite long now that carriers of, uh, of uh, polymorphism in alpha-5 uh, nicotinic receptors are more sensitive to nicotine reward and less sensitive to nicotine aversion. Regarding, uh, regarding the cues acting as reinforcer, as conditioned reinforcer, for some people, switch to nicotine-free cigarette can decrease craving, just this switch. And um, for others, uh, and maybe related to uh, the reinforcing, um, the nicotine-inducing, uh, um, enhancing the uh, reinforcing effect of surrounding stimuli, uh, in some people, nicotine withdrawal can cause sensory anhedonia. So all in all, there might be individual variation or differences in the motifs and mechanisms of seeking, and maybe uh, those people would need different treatments. So we simply uh, explored whether there could be individual variations in mechanisms, motifs that support self-administration. And we did a very common nicotine self-administration study where you put nicotine, you know, you self-administer, the animals self-administer nicotine and the cue the light is coming. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's reinforcing a little bit by itself. And uh, here it's associated contingently with nicotine. And it's very classical, uh, FR3, no time out, uh, three hours schedule, active, inactive, all, as you all know. And you see this development of self-administration, 30 infusion for three hours in 62 animals. And what we did simply, very simply, we omitted nicotine on one session and we, we uh, omitted, um, sorry, we omitted the cue, so only nicotine self-administration. And on another session, we omitted nicotine, so only the cue for saline. And then we did, uh, we won't enter into the detail, we're late. Uh, we uh, did a simple coming cluster analysis and on several um, uh, variables. And we just explored whether there could be subpopulation in rats in which, in which nicotine, the Q, or an interaction of both uh, contribute differently to nicotine self-administration. And what we saw is that we identified two clusters, uh, 34 and 28 rats. So cluster A, when you do a Q omission, so only nicotine, you have a this is, this is the session. This is time into the session, three hours. This is the baseline, and this is the Q emission. Baseline, Q emission. And the same for nicotine emission, just Q self-administration. And what you see is that you have very different profile between the two clusters. Cluster A is, um, is showing an extinction uh, more uh, when just nicotine is self-administered compared to cluster B. And regarding the nicotine emission, so self-administering only the cue, you have a much stronger uh, self-administration behavior, maintenance of self-administration behavior in cluster B rather than cluster A, which shows a rapid extension and decrease uh, as a maximal effect. So rapidly, when we look at the other features of these two clusters in terms of nicotine reinforcement, so just nicotine self-administration, Q is omitted here, we see that the breakpoint is higher in cluster B, and this is the time course of the progressive ratio in the two groups, and the dose response curve for nicotine alone also is shifted upward in the cluster B. So it sounds like there is a higher nicotine reinforcing effect in cluster B. And we did a nicotine Q disconnection test where we put the nicotine on the other side and maintain the Q on this side. And what we see is that uh, we have a very different profile. We have an extinction of responding for the Q in cluster B while we have a maintenance in cluster A. So this sounds like there is no extinction of Q reinforcing properties in cluster A, supporting that Q reinforcement depends in this animal on concomitant nicotine action. That's um, differently, there is an extinction of Q reinforcing properties in cluster B, supporting that Q reinforcement depends on contingent nicotine in this rat, fitting with what we have here, meaning that we need both nicotine and Q for cluster A, 
while one or the other can maintain self-administration of cluster B. So, and this is to conclude, if we look at basal self-administration in these two clusters, they are completely similar. So within a global population, you have animals doing exactly the same in terms of basal nicotine plus Q self-administration, but completely apparently do it for different reasons. And I'm too late, and I would like to thank all these people who have been uh, inspiring over the last so many years. Thank you and sorry for being long. Thank you. Um, we have a, a time for a couple of questions and we have a question in the Q&A. Uh, the first one is, could you comment on our choice of drug interacts in human who might prefer different drugs even after trying those drugs? Could this model predict what kind of drug an individual has more chances to get addicted to? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm reading at the same time because I have some problem to hear you. Could you comment on our choice of drug interacts in humans who might prefer different drugs even after trying those drugs? Could this model predict what kind of drug an individual has more chances to get addicted to? Wow, well, this that, that's a question. <laughs> uh, choice of drug interacts in humans. They are, pe people sh show some preferences for sure. They are, drug preferences, but I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm correctly understanding the question. Right. What Maybe do you mean by could this model predict? Does it refer to poly substance abuse? So if you had multiple drugs on board, um, does this exacerbate, um, you know, uh, punishment resistant or maladaptive seeking if you have multiple substances converging, like is often the human case? Can you say that again? Sorry. You mean that you, the idea is that if you have multi, multiple uh, drug use, different types of use, what would be the impact on? Right, if you had, right. So nicotine and alcohol together, um, I'm trying to interpret the question a little bit. If you had nicotine and alcohol together, would that increase the rate of developing maladaptive seeking behavior for either of those drugs? Um, or do you think it, you know, so do you think there's an interaction at the, the level of the drug or specific drugs people are taking? Or do you think this is a more global uh, property of addictive substances? This is a very good question. Uh, <laughs> this is a very good question. Um, how, how can I probably answer this question? Um, is there... try to figure out whether there are examples of uh, um, honestly it's it's a difficult question to answer like this because um, mechanisms are prop My answer would be depending, I mean, probably between some classes of drugs, I would say yes. Uh, the example of nicotine and alcohol is, is, is a very um, um, specific one. And for having uh, tested the negative consequences, I mean, negative consequences on, 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 on nicotine self-administration, for example, is something that is uh, completely uh, non-effective. So uh, the properties, and, 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 and some people here will probably uh, uh, completely uh, agree with me, is that um, depending on uh, the type of drug and the psycho, I mean, the, 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 the pharmacological properties of the drug, uh, you have an interaction uh, with behavior. So um, I would say that, yeah, probably for some, and, and, and it, it's clear that there, there is 
often a, 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 a drug of choice and people have alternative if they can't as far as i know and but most probably if if and and i think i'm correct this there are also a gradation in the other choice they will make so um i would say yes for uh, certain classes of drugs not sure i completely uh, have whole elements to answer here excellent um, yeah, I had a quick question. I know that we're running a little bit late on time, um, but I thought it was interesting that the, the best early predictors of mice that go on to develop the maladaptive seeking to develop this punishment resistant phenotype seem to be related to impulsivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And whether that, you know, does that tell us anything really uh, crucial about the circuitry that's involved or whether, you know, this maladaptive behavior is really an expression of just the inability to, you know, withhold the response or is there, you know, is it, Basically, is there, is there anything um, I'm missing regarding the insight we can get from those two tests being the most predictive or that impulsive uh, trait being the most predictive of maladaptive seeking? So it's, it's, pre I mean, it's, it's predictive in sense of we, we have this shift from impulsive to compulsive. And I mean, the best person to answer that, and I think he presented it um, marvelously is, is David who did a fantastic talk last time. And I think the answers are all there. And uh, I want, uh, I mean, the answers are there, definitely, yeah. Uh, Christine, do you have anything to add? I think we're, that was, you know, an excellent talk. Um, I think we're just a little bit over time. Um, Sorry for that. No, that's, no, that's nothing to add. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Veronique, for the great talk. Um, and I think we should wrap it up because we're a little bit late. But right, so I will just add uh, for anybody uh, watching that these talks are all available on YouTube. They can be navigated to on our um, Neurobiology of Addiction page. And we are going to take a break for the summer, but we'll be back on September 9th, I believe. Correct. Uh, so we be, great. <laughs> uh, so we hope to see everyone then. Thank you so much. Bye.